Good afternoon, everyone. We're so glad that you're here today. My name is Julie Taberer, and I'm the head of our Grand Rapids History and Special Collections Department here at the library. Just want to kind of a few announcements to start off. If you are parked in the library parking lot, I have green parking tickets to give you. You uh, don't need to pay when you come to programs here, so that'll get you out for free. We have um, some surveys on the back table. We always appreciate feedback if you want to fill one of those out. And after the program today, um, we have uh, the Bookman here, the bookstore in Grand Haven, and they have some books available for sale. And Marcel Price also has some items available for sale. And I also want to let you know that on November 7, the Grand Rapids Public Library will be asking voters to renew an expiring millage for another 20 years. Homeowners will not see an increase in their taxes, and the average homeowner will pay $18.76 a year. To learn more, you can visit our website, or there's brochures in the back. And I am basically, we're so honored to have all of you here today. It is very exciting. And I am going to turn it over to Marcel Price, Fable the Poet, Grand Rapids Poet Laureate, uh, based out of the library. So we're very excited to have him introduce everybody and get things started. How are you all doing today? I need a little bit more energy than that. How are you all doing today? Yeah, this is an event definitely worthy getting excited about. Um, we have the honor to have some of the best uh, poets, some of the best creatives in the state of Michigan here today in Grand Rapids. Um, and you all are in for a treat. Their wealth of knowledge, um, the caliber of their writing, they are all incredible individuals. Um, I'm going to start this off with a poem, and then I will be introducing and passing it off to them. Uh, as you heard, my name is Marcel Price, or Fable. I am Grand Rapids' new Poet Laureate. Um, I am the, the, the reason that title means so much to me um, is because I'm an individual who came from nothing. I came from a very poor, low-income background. Um, I came from a very traumatic uprising. I grew up in a home rooted in abuse, so I didn't have a lot of value a majority of my life. And to be the first poet laureate of color in city history, as well as the youngest poet laureate in city history, that means a lot to me. Um, and it makes me like very, very, very proud to be the ambassador and the representative for poetry in Grand Rapids. Um, this first poem that I'm going to read um, is about the west side of Grand Rapids. How many of you guys are familiar with the west side? Yeah. Um, the West Side is quickly changing. Um, there are some positives to the change, um, and there are also some negatives to the change. Um, the same way that we saw East Town change. Uh, East Town used to be a very diverse part of town. Um, I used to love East Town because I would walk down the bricks and I would see so many people who looked like me and it made me feel comfortable. And I would see families and kids walking down the street and it made me go, you know what, this is a place that I wanna raise a family, right? Um, and then time happens and a lot of those local businesses are no longer there and a lot of those residents can no longer afford their homes. Um, and now we see people in fancy mustaches and flannel shirts and not a lot of diversity anymore. Um, and I'm very scared that that's going to happen to the West Side. Um, my favorite things about the West Side is that I see kids running up and down our street. My girlfriend will do uh, hair and nail parties for the, the young women in our community. Um, we'll celebrate our next door neighbor's birthdays and like cook them cakes. And just like really like, that's, that's my favorite part about the West Side is its community. And I feel like too often, here in Grand Rapids and elsewhere, um, we don't really take pride in our community. Is there anybody in this room who feels that they know like 10 people on their street very, very well, like they're close with 10 people on their street? One, two, three. I feel like we've lost touch of that. Um, and I feel like that's something that we definitely need to take more pride in, especially people who are proud of Grand Rapids and proud of our city. Like your, your activism, your taking action should start with your neighborhood, your block. Get to know these families, get to know the people that are in your neighborhood. And that's really what this poem is about. Um, but it's called, I Fall on Gold. It is November on gold. 
blocks away from the bitter end of a neighborhood divided, the city doesn't even try to hide it. But they keep trying to test me. The Little Caesars around the corner says, we no longer serve pepperoni cheese bread, as if they stop carrying pepperoni or cheese bread. I'm not gonna lie, y'all. This might be the straw that broke the camel's pack, but I used to smoke American spirits a pack a day to keep the stress of rent raising away. They are charging market rate without a market in sight. We don't need a mire or a target down the street. We are wearing bullseyes already. They are gunning for our exit drive-by, but not at night. There are no street lights, so you won't be able to witness bask in that for a while. My neighbor tells me the woman that used to live here had one hell of a green thumb. The roses she planted before her eviction tell me good morning from my shady porch. They wave hello, tip their crimson fall floppy hat at me through gravel stones, showing me she was one hell of a botanist. Too bad passion didn't pay the bills. I wonder if he will tell the next tenants that I was one heck of a writer. I wonder if the words of encouragement that me and my girlfriend litter on their children's minds will last longer than the value of our home, longer than the stories of jade digits, the ghost of tenants past still haunts our entryway. I wonder if our landlord will paint over the hieroglyphics left by her children, or if they will stay as a reminder that we are only as good as the green in our pockets, not the crayon-coded phrase that greets you in entering our home. The voice of this child bellows pipe organ and brings me to church every time I go to leave. I imagine fingers embracing Crayola keys. It reads, a-hole. I assume this message was written to the people that asked them to go, those remodeling the home the same way they are restructuring the community for higher income. It is November on gold. In July, there was a ranch home behind us. There's now a concrete slab where a home once stood, yet here, I hear we have an issue with lack of housing, irony. Two doors down from me, a shiny new blue door secures the nicest residence on the street. A home erected quicker than my morals. Every Friday night, when they party, I can hear it from down the street. Wonder if the kids in the 10 homes around us are able to sleep. I imagine, I imagine stealing their big screen TV. I can see it every time I walk by, simultaneously pacing and contemplating if I should ask them to please quiet down. I imagine how good surround that I can't afford would sound with that screen in my living room. I wonder if it would tune out their music or the ghost of tenants past. The sound of police stopping the residents they're busy blaming for the theft, you know, the ones who will conveniently match the description, it is November on Gold Street. And I just want to focus on the leaves, but I already know that they want us to leave. Until then, I will play with the children while they are still here. I'll create a symphony of laughter that rattles windows, awakening college students from hangover-coded slumbers. I will make them wish that we would quiet down. I will show the neighborhood kids that we don't have to be quiet, that we shouldn't be. Thank you all very, very much. So it is my privilege to introduce this first reader. Um, I got to hear her yesterday, and both of these individuals are such a wealth of knowledge. Um, they're just brilliant creatives and their work oozes that knowledge and it oozes that brilliance. Uh, Sonia Ponce is a Kalalu, a Kalalu a Creative Writing Workshop Fellow and holds a Master's of Arts in Creative Writing from Central Michigan University. Her work has appeared in Kalalalu, Temenos, The Central Review, Aunt Cole, A Journal of Artful Candor, and Drum Voices Review, as well as the anthologies Poet in the House, Abandoned Automobile, and ah, eclaps, <laughs> Eclapsing a Nappy New Millennium. She was a broadside press poet in residence for the Detroit Public Library and an inside out poet in residence for the Detroit Public School District. Currently, Sonia is working on a collection of poems about the life of Miss Henrietta Lacks, progenitor of the immortal Hellasell line. Everybody, please, a very, very, very warm Grand Rapids round of applause for Sonia. Please put your hands together for Sonia, everybody. I can 
cut this one off if you want. I don't know. Actually, can you guys hear me? Uh, your video fellow will not catch you at all. Okay. If you want, can you raise this and lower these? Yes, yeah. let's, can we do that? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Okay. Wonderful. So I'll give that one back to you. Okay. I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, can we raise this up a little bit? I don't know if that'll come back. Thank you. Oh, just pull it? Oh, and then it just, it locks? Oh, wonderful. Okay, perfect. Okay. So um, thank you guys for coming out this afternoon. Um, and thank you to, uh, let's see, who are all of our sponsors? Let's make sure I remember everybody. Uh, certainly the, the Grand Rapids uh, Public Library and, and to, to Fable the Poet, uh, your, your Poet Laureate, and to uh, the folks at Lowe Library in Grand Haven and the folks at the Bookman who are in the back of the store, or the back of the room here. Um, and to David Schock uh, for, for organizing, and for organizing all this. Okay, better? Okay, wonderful. Okay, get real close to it here, okay. So as Fable mentioned, I am working on a collection of poems related to the life of Henrietta Lacks. How many of you have heard of Henrietta Lacks? Oh, all the hands, oh wonderful, okay. So, uh, but I'm gonna start with a, a, a jazz poem yes. um, by request. So. <laughs> and then we'll, then we'll move into the Henrietta series. So this piece um, is called Night of Respite. And this is written or was written after hanging out at a jazz club with a couple of friends in Detroit. As Miles watches from wall at downtown jazz juke joint, we unbutton overcoats uncap selves and settle in. Over empty baskets and half-filled glasses, we talk of non-parties in triplicate form. At jukebox interlude, young tongue traces James Brown, mourns soundtrack of sparkle, leaps space-time in pulse width. Size 12 leather lesson and backward bebop leaves two feet plus mine in spaghetti pool on floor. And cigarette conjures train from old dollar bin, Detroit man to stage and horn gods to follow. And they blow us away. Past due dates and nightmares, days lasting too long, past you, me, distinctions, till each of us arrives at multiplicity of I and become note peeling darkness till we link with the self. Infinite brief moment, three and one, then it's gone. Thank you. So uh, this collection that I'm working on uh, for Henrietta, um, it's a series of persona poems. So they're all written in the voices of uh, people in her life. Um, this first piece that I'll start off with is written um, from Henrietta's perspective. And when I say written in their voice, not necessarily the vernacular or language that they would use, but just from their perspective. So this piece is uh, written in Henrietta's perspective and or from her perspective. Um, this is her waiting in the, the waiting room of Johns Hopkins Hospital. And a couple things that you should know about the hospital is that the, the hospital in 1951 had uh, two wards, one ward for Caucasian people and one ward for colored people. In the colored ward, the benches in the waiting room uh, appeared to be old church pew benches that were just donated to the hospital. And the other thing about the colored ward is that the exam rooms of the colored ward, uh, the walls of those rooms were glass. So there was no privacy really for the, the people who were um, being treated. So if you were in an exam room, um, the people in the waiting room and the people in the rooms on the side of you saw exactly what the doctors and the nurses saw, okay? So this is in the colored waiting room, in the colored ward waiting room of Johns Hopkins Hospital. These nurses, with their crisp uniforms and starched hats, have never sat on this particular wood 
an old church pew ingrained with prayers. They have not studied pools of yellowed dust in these narrow crevices or watched that same dust, if blown, carry salt pork prayers heavenward before falling, being the dust that it is to the floor. They have not sat here staring at this floor, pretending not to see the dis-ease of disrobing, trying to avoid the modest eyes of other colored women and men, unavoidable through clear glass walls that mark exam rooms of the colored ward, that allow a nurse to maintain her station while judging the nakedness of ten. Never have they feared the wrath of a forgotten caress or tribute of flowers or wondered whether their demoted Jesus with marble arms wide enough to gather masses can close them without breaking to embrace just one. They cross this wood with their sturdy heels and clipboards, with their fine words and learned letters, checking boxes for things I will never understand. They will follow orders to weigh me and chart me. But what do they know of my body? What do they know of my disdainful beauty or their own faint reflections in this glass erected by men? Thank you. Um, so this next piece, uh, A Revisionist Confession at Night, this is written in the voice of, or from the perspective of Dr. George Guy. He was the, um, the, the lead researcher on her case, and he was the one responsible for, um, for collecting um, her cells, right? And, and actually, he's credited with the discovery of the HeLa cell. Question? Ah, okay, so I'm sorry. I'll give you a little bit of background about Henrietta Lacks. So Henrietta Lacks was an African-American woman who died in 1951 of cervical cancer. She was treated uh, at Baltimore's Johns Hopkins Hospital. Uh, we have recently found out that the cause of her cervical cancer was the human papillomavirus. Um, but uh, at the time that she was treated at Johns Hopkins, there was just this kind of lemony splicket confluence of events, and they happened to be looking for an immortal cell line at that hospital at that time. And when they took a piece of her cancerous cells um, without her permission, they found that indeed her cells were immortal. They uh, then proceeded to um, use them in laboratory research, um, for years before her family found out. Um, her cells are used as, in the biological, pharmacological, scientific um, industries uh, worldwide. Uh, they continue to be used today. If, for example, you uh, or, or a, a manufacturer wants to um, produce a new product, say a new lipstick, a new makeup, a new toothpaste, um, something, that the, and they need to test it on people, and they don't want to test it on people because you, that might be expensive or um, they're not sure if it's going to be harmful or not, they may test them on her cells. So her cells have been, um, they've been sent to the moon to see how human bodies would behave uh, in zero gravity before we sent people up. Um, they have been, um, used in nuclear um, uh, experiments to see what would the effects be of um, nuclear explosions on the human body. Um, they are used, pretty much every laboratory, every medical school is using her cells to this day. Um, her family, after they did find out about it, they did um, there's been a, there was a, 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 a biography written about her, and as a result of that, um, her family did not receive necessarily compensation, but they have, um, my understanding is they have reached an agreement with the National Institutes of Health, so that today, if somebody wants to use her cells for research, um, they go before this body that is uh, combined of uh, NIH representatives as well as family representatives, and uh, if they are given approval to use the cells for research, they must give uh, Henrietta credit for this. So basically, any drug that you use has likely been tested on her cells, 
and um, she was never compensated or told that her cells had been taken and used for this purpose. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm gonna, uh, because of that, I'm gonna just kind of shorten this a little bit. I'll read uh, just two more pieces. And uh, so that I can, well, because I'm looking at the time. Uh, so this, this uh, second piece here is a, a revisionist confession at night. Um, so the doctors at Johns Hopkins um, claim that, or at least one of the doctors, George Guy, claims that he spoke to Henrietta and told her that her cells were immortal and that they, that they were going to help a lot of people. There's no evidence of that um, at all. And so the only person who... Um, attests to that is the doctor himself. Um, and so this is uh, a revisionist confession at night. The black and white of you blends to gray. My little amphora, limniscus of life. My secret weapon against human trial and error. I discovered you perfectly suited for laboratory work, a life in the round of petri dishes and microscope lenses that transforms your gray into its purple splendor, that transforms your splendid purple to rainbow promises of infinite discovery and the elixir of gods. This I would confess directly to your desperately beautiful eyes were it not such new ground that you have broken, that I now stand upon. Here, I am duty bound to confide this to your photograph or your questioned face under a starlit sky whose orchestral brilliance, full with wishes of children and lovers, can do nothing but wane beside you. Thank you. Um, man, I really wanted to do that one. Darn it. Okay, so, well, oh, that's right, because we have an hour and a half. It's not just an hour, right? Okay, two more. Okay, so this, this last one, so this one, this, um, this is the, 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 the penultimate poem. Uh, this is called Footnote. This is written in the voice of Mary Kupasek and she was the laboratory assistant in Dr. Guy's lab, and she was actually responsible for culturing the cells. So after they took the cells out of her cervix, they brought them to Mary and said, here, please put these in a Petri dish and feed them and take care of them. And so that was Mary's job. And Mary did a really good job, and of course we found out later that these cells are immortal. And so um, as a reward for that job, um, Mary was given the opportunity to attend Henrietta's um, autopsy. Um, and prior to that, Mary had never had any interaction with a person um, whose cells she had been working with. So she was just somebody who just got tissue samples and worked in the laboratory all the time. So this is the first time that she realizes, oh, this, this is a person that I'm dealing with. So this is called Footnote. One, I tell myself I will not mess this up that they will never know how scared I am. But I hover in the doorway like the girl I am until Dr. Wilbur calls me in. I see her body laid out before him, her chest already open like an ancient book, each organ a fallen country of soldiers, each waving a flag of surrender. I can't help but think of pearls, how they are formed, the calcium carbonate, ca carbonate engulfing some foreign material, a speck of sand, perhaps. The way the hardening tries to ease discomfort, the way we value that reaction, culture it in mollusks and in ourselves. Two, I do not want to see her face or know that she is beautiful. I do not care that her teeth are straight I fit myself into the space by one of her arms, raised above her head, as if in death she were a student eager to ask, no, to answer a brilliant question. When Wilbur holds out a piece of her, I extend a petri dish. 
He lays her on the auger the way a jeweler places a ring in a presentation box. I seal it, set it aside, and pick up another. Three, when there is nothing left to sample, I gather my dishes and think how her open cavity is a night sky full of stars, their beautiful violence consuming themselves. I do not notice the scar where her deviated septum was repaired. I do not notice the bruising on her wrists and ankles that were tied to bed rails to keep her from thrashing. Then there is the red shift. I see it, the chipped polish of her toenails. And I am reminded she is not a receding galaxy. I am not a disinterested observer. We are the same women, flesh and bone, fashioned, heart and body, subject to the curiosities of men. And this last piece is written in the voice of, or from the perspective of Rebecca Skloot, who was actually the science journalist and researcher who wrote the biography of Henrietta. Um, and a little bit of background about this poem, because it can be um, interpreted a number of different ways. So Rebecca uh, was not a great student when she was in school. She ended up at an alternative school. And her instructor there in a biology class happened to mention the name of Henrietta Lacks. And he was talking about cells and cell division and how cells behave in the body. Henry, uh, Rebecca was very in intrigued with the idea that these cells that she was looking at on the board came from a person. And so she wanted to do a little bit of research on Henrietta. And she was surprised to find that there was, there was nothing, right? And so her, you know, 14, 15 year old brain said, hmm, when I grow up, I'm gonna find out about that woman. And so as Rebecca just grew and continued to get her education and as she uh, went to college, her interest in Henrietta continued. And eventually um, in grad school, she decided that she was gonna research this and, and write a book about Henrietta's life as well as the life of the Gila cells. And so she did. So this poem, again, is just from her perspective and I kind of envision um, Rebecca's um, being taken with Henrietta, almost being obsessed with Henrietta as kind of falling in love with her. So it's kind of a love poem from Rebecca's perspective to Henrietta. And um, also there's a, a line in here um, about, uh, some white pages. So the first time that, that, Henry, that, that Rebecca comes across the cells, they're in the pages of a book. So that's how she meets Henrietta. Um, there's a photograph of her in a book. Rebecca speaks to Henrietta of first and lasting impressions. They say you never get over your first love. I don't know if that's true for everyone, but I know I never got over you. Your walnut gaze, your eternal smile. I was 16 when we met in Mr. Deffler's biology. The most noteworthy subject was the way you stood akimbo, your sepia skin against my white pages. Unvoiced, you still told all the answers, explained with your body the mathematics of cells, their curious adding up and what they can take away. You were magic with your pink mitochondria and smart suit jacket, resolving questions posed by science and mythology to Lind and Ponce de Leon. More than any teacher or mentor, it was your cultured presence, your manicured hands that led me from alternative school to graduate school. It was all of you that I wanted from your red toenails to your cervical cells, more than a life confined to parenthetical clauses and erudite journals, I would pursue you in hallways of higher learning, cross rivers and railroad tracks for a mere glimpse of you, the hem of your A-line skirt, a thread of your bright blue actin, only to share you with your husband and three boys, 
your daughter with question marks for eyebrows, the whole world even, so that with gratitude and study, from disparate suppositions to your unifying theory, from heaven to Gila and back again, all will know, all will remember and love you as I do, Henrietta, even your purple carcinoma, even your stained DNA. Thank you. One more time, everybody, please put your hands together for Sonia one more time. Um, so it is my privilege to introduce this next individual, well, these, these, both these individuals. Um, but before, I am going to read a poem. Um, so for those that do not know me, I do a lot of work. Uh, I do a lot of writing about mental health. Uh, I'm somebody who at age 14 was diagnosed with anxiety, bipolar, and depression. And I really like tying organizations that I've worked with together. So recently I tied a local university that I've been working with uh, together with Mental Health America, somebody who I partner with and go across the country to talk about mental health. And I'll, I, I think that I'm strong often, um, and that I'm, I'm, I'm holding myself together very well. And the other day I was sitting in this classroom and I'm going over these students' videos. Uh, one group of students was doing a video on anxiety, one bipolar, one depression, and I was going through these videos, giving them critiques, da 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 da, -da. Uh, and I started watching this video on bipolar, and the idea behind this video is somebody has like this little scepter, this little ghost that comes on their shoulder, and like when they're angry, the ghost turns red, and when they're sad, the ghost turns blue, and when they're like at an even point, the ghost is green, and after this interaction and all these up and downs, this individual goes to leave the building, and somebody saw them leaving and saw that they were sad and went up to console them. And it was like a call to action to where it's like when you see somebody struggling to help them out. Um, but me, being very reactionary, I saw this video and I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. the issue is, is that you, you have both these individuals that are blue and when you're, when you're spiraling, when you're down, you'll never be at a point of where you'll see somebody else who's down. And I like, went on this tangent and I was like all upset and I started crying in this room and it was really, really bad. And then like one of the students stood up and was like, oh, they're... The one is green and one is blue. I'm sorry for like not having the colors right and da 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 And like then I just felt really embarrassed that I like made a fool of myself as I was like correcting this video. But I say that to say um, if you see somebody struggling, if you see somebody who's having a hard time to take the time to make sure that they're okay and not be reactionary. Um, and that's this next poem is about my struggles with mental health because it's always a journey and it's always hard. Once it hatches, a caterpillar starts to feed on the egg in which it was born, then the leaves around it. In 12 to 24 hours, it will shed its skin. It will repeat this cycle multiple times so that it can grow. But once big enough, hormones will dictate that it stops eating before it makes the final transformation. It will choose a spot under a covered location and build a chrysalis. The stage is called pupa. They break themselves into nothing, devours itself. After 15 days, a butterfly emerges. The series of changes in a butterfly's lifespan is called metamorphosis. So now I'm sitting there watching this Animal Planet show about butterflies because who can stay upset when looking at butterflies, right? Yet there I was. A snot tear extravaganza, ugly face cherry on top, sprinkled with that hideous dying lion seal noise, the one people make when they're really upset, like, Ooh, crying my eyes out. I can laugh about it now because I learned about the cycle. It starts with feeding, destroying and engulfing the very things that give it life, the same way I did my mother. The same way I proceed to with lovers, friends, my environment, and people that unknowingly become new leaves for me to turn over when I crave destruction, not yet willing to take it out on myself, though I always do. Somehow, they're always kind enough to take me back every time I metabolize them and shed dead layers of myself, though I don't deserve it. They often follow with a, you should be so proud of how much you've grown, but I never am. 
They don't know that each time my hunger evolves alongside me, it becomes larger. I strive to take up more space no matter how minute I feel. Every time I feel even close to big enough, I stop eating, fill myself on excuses. I forgot today I was too busy and worst I don't deserve it until I pick a spot under a covered location. The documentary called this the pupa stage. Is my couch not a chrysalis or cocoon? The bathroom floor, the bed in the guest room away from the woman I love, the places I lock myself away for days from nurture, are they not that protective layer? The place I wrap myself in to feel whole before breaking into nothing so I feel safe enough to spread my wings. When you are laying there motionless, this is when your mind is nature's magic. Body still metabolizing itself. After days I emerge, that vibrant flowing being that so many see. When battling anxiety, bipolar, and depression, ask yourself, isn't it strange how a caterpillar's transformation into a butterfly can look so much like me? Um, before I call this individual up, I wanna thank GRCC uh, for co-sponsoring this event and also videotaping this event. Uh, Professor Muhammad is one of like my favorite individuals in Grand Rapids. Um, incredibly, incredibly, incredibly brilliant human being. Um, so yeah, if you guys could put your hands together for them, that would be incredible. Um, thank you guys very much. I wanted uh, to read that poem because I am a very, very young poet laureate, so a lot of my writing is about my experience, but it's all from a, a point of wanting to learn and curiosity. And the, the poet laureate who I am honored to be able to call up is such a wealth of knowledge and writes from so much experience. And I fell in love with her work last night because Hearing her, I feel like I, I just became more wise from even just like listening and soaking up her story. Um, she is such a beautiful human being who has been through so much. And last night I said that um, it's incredible because in school, when we learn about black history, we're, we're taught exactly what they want to teach us. And this human being behind me is black history and black present. And it's, I, it's just such an honor to be able to, to soak up everything that they have to say. Um, Dr. Magit, books of poetry includes Songs to a Phantom, Nightingale, One in the Many, Star by Star, Pink Ladies in the Afternoon, Exits and Entrances, Octavia and Other Poems, Remembrances of Spring, Phantom Nightingale, Juvenalia, Octavia, Guthrie and Beyond, Connected Islands, New and Selected Poems. In addition, she has edited a number of collection, perhaps the most notable, Adam of Life, Black Woman, huh? Ife, I'm sorry, Adam of Ife, Black Woman in Praise of Black Men, Dr. Magit has served as Poet Laureate of the City of Detroit since 2001 and is the recipient of the 2012 Kresge Eminent Artist Award. Among her other honors are the American Book Award, induction into three halls of fame, four honorary degrees, and several lifetime achievement awards. She has recorded some of her poems for inclusion in the collections of Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. As Poet Laureate, she read her poem celebrating the tricentennial of Detroit and watched it sealed in a time capsule December 34, 2001, to be opened in 100 years. Her poems appear in numerous journals and more than 180 anthologies, both here and abroad. Several have been set to music. She also has written her autobiography, Pilgrim Journey. As founder and editor of Lotus Press, she has published more than 90 collections, most of them first books for up and coming poets. In 1993, the National Naomi Long Magit, Magit Poetry Award was established to recognize and publish an outstanding manuscript by African American poets. This annual award continues under the sponsorship of Broadside Lotus Press. Some of these poems, Naomi will be accompanied by Robin Connell. Um, 
it was also an honor being able to soak up this human being's incredible talents. Um, Robin Connell, originally from Detroit, is a West Michigan Jazz Society's 2017 Musician of the Year. She follows the tradition of singer-pianist Shirley Horn, Diana Krall, and Blossom Deary, leading her own jazz trio and original arrangements of time-honored jazz standards, such as those heard on her CD, A Beautiful Friendship. Honing her craft over a decade in New York City at places such as Waldorf Astoria and the Rainbow Room and Rockefeller Center, she brings the sophistication of the great American songbook to life in her own charming, in her own charming, in her own charming way. Um, they're listening to their set last night. Um, it blew me away because their ability to go back and forth from the songs that you hear in the poem and tell their story over music and poetry is something like I've never heard before. You all are in for such a treat. Everybody, please give them a proper Grand Rapids round of applause. Put your hands together for these incredible individuals. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you for that kind introduction. I'm going to start with a poem called Genesis, The Missing Chapter. And when God had created the world and all things in it, and sat down on the seventh day to rest from his labors, he was pleased with his view of mountains and islands of clouds floating in, sea, in a sea blue sky. He delighted in the scent of hyacinths and frankincense and the taste of salt and honey. The bark of trees and the fur of rabbits was pleasant to his touch. But when humans uttered sound, their speech fell like a dull thud, earthbound, a babble, discordant to his ear. And he said, there is something I have forgotten something I still must do. And he thought and thought about it until he noticed the trilling of a tiny bird. So on the eighth day, God took the lilt of birds and called it joy. He borrowed the rhythm of the ocean and called it supplication. The roar of thunder he named despair. He gathered the many voices of the wind and called them exaltation and he named the rustle of leaves thanksgiving. The whisper of rain became love, and the murmur of a brook, faith and hope. He bound them all together and called them music and planted it in the human voice. Then he created poets so that music could be sung in words. And choirs rejoiced, organs consecrated, Violins implored, drums celebrated, clarinets wailed, trumpets praised, trombones lamented, and saxophones glorified God in the highest. And God said, now my world is truly complete. Hereafter, whenever humans seek to communicate with each other and with me, music will forever be the purest vehicle for car carrying the varied messages of the soul. I never lived in Richmond, Virginia, but my, my mother was from there, and she, uh, we went from New Jersey to Richmond every summer, and it was, uh, really a joyous occasion because of all the wonderful things that happened in, in those summer week, weeks. Uh, eventually, the house was torn down to make room for a, a freeway. And I was on my way from uh, Washington to Richmond to do a workshop and realized that when I got off at a certain exit, that was re exactly where my grandparents' house had stood. This poem is called, in several parts, Fifth Street Exit, Richmond. Leave the freeway at this point. Drive off where a chain fence, 
chain link fence separates the road from a patch of weeds and forces you past a row of ancient houses dying from the fever of progress. Hurry past. Proceed with cautious speed down Fifth Street to Maine, beyond the place where death lurks, where airy ghosts peer through the dust of floor-long windows and scream with hollow voices, voiceless mouths. The phantom children are calling. They are calling my name. They are playing hide and seek by yellow street light and they cannot find me. I am be busy chasing fireflies. The phantom children are calling, calling my name. I could go back if I wanted to. I could join the dance again, bouncing my feet with theirs on the sidewalk of uneven brick as they jump, jump, and jump Jim Crow. I could learn again to make the swooping gesture cotton needs a pickin' so bad in rhythm with their song, graceless newcomer from the North, but eager to be one with them. Cotton needs a pickin' so bad, I'm gonna pick all over this land. I could do it again if I wanted to. The clop, clop, clop of horses' hooves the clatter of wagon wheels on cobblestones bring the street vendor to the shade of our magnolias. Above the horses whinnying, his cindery voice, half song, half wail, bellows, blasts across the heavy air. Get your fresh watermelon, sweet melon, cold melon, black seeded, juicy melon, ripe melon, sweet. Oh, the spicy redolence of summertime. Oh, the fr fresh fruit glories of southern summertime. Watermelon, sweet melon, black seeded fresh melon, come by your watermelon, ripe melon sweet. Will and Clarence and Dady and Lou played mumbledy peg by the curb, and Susie whimpered and put up her hair in balls while Bubba chased me around the yard, and Grandpa died, and Bubba cried, and knocked me down and gashed my head, and Dady's father stitched my wound, and Sadie cut my hair that summer, and seasons come, and long years went, and Richmond just kept coming back, and we were grown before we guessed the wonder that those summers meant. I wish I could go back to the cool green shuttered dark that hid us from the boisterous sun, from the explosion of color and fragrance outside, back into the cocoon, back to the Concord grapes ripening in the arbor where the swing hung still, patient, waiting for the evening cool, afternoon baths, and starched white eyelet dresses with blue sashes and patent leather shoes. Richmond summers chocolate as childhood's toothsomest delights. I wish I could. Azalea petals fell for the last time one spring and tried in vain to fertilize this asphalt garden. The bricks crumbled and were hauled away the green shutters fell to dust, and where Grandma's white pillared porch once welcomed Sunday callers, a chain link fence went up to mark an exit from wherever, USA, to Main Street, Richmond. Leave the freeway at this point and don't, oh, don't go back. Don't listen to the children's hollow voices chanting elegies to the whirr of wheels turning, turning. Uh, this poem uh, is written in, in the uh, voice of uh, 
a contemporary uh, African-American urban. It's called Soon I Will Be Done, which comes from a, near, uh, a Negro spiritual, I'm so glad trouble don't last always. And uh, th this, uh, that, the Soon I Will Be Done is going to be played and sung at this time. Now you get to see what he's here for. My, my, Takes a second. Yes, it does. Wow. My sole function is to hold the microphone. <laughs> I can't. Oh, well, let's see. Okay. You can come closer. You might bite. There. Are you left handed? Troubles of the world, the troubles of the world. So, soon I will be done. All my life, I've been waiting for trouble to pass. If it wasn't a flood, it was a drought. If it wasn't a boll weevil, it was white folks trying to take our land. Soon as we built a house big enough for all the kids, they raised our taxes. Then Papa died, and Mama come to live with us with all her furniture, because brothers say we the onlyest ones with that much room. Soon as son got out of trouble, Susie come up pregnant. We was all so proud of Junior when he come back home from Vietnam with medals and honors and his picture in the paper till the police get gunned him down robbing a grocery store. At least that's what they told us. I used to sing in church, and truly I did believe, soon I will be done with the troubles of the world, going home to live with God. But I bet you anything, soon as I get to heaven, the golden stairs is going to fall down, and God's going to say, Sister Johnson, see can you give, me, give us a hand here, sure as anything. I'm the one who has to build them back up again. I call this poem Midway because uh, it was written uh, just a few years after the Supreme Court Desegregation Act. And for the first time, justice was on our side in law. And 
Some progress had already been made, but there was still a long way to go, and so I called it Midway. And uh, I think I'll read it first. It has been set to music by uh, uh, Gerald Savage some time ago. I've come this far to freedom, and I won't turn back. I'm climbing to the highway from my old dirt track. I'm coming and I'm going, and I'm stretching and I'm growing, and I'll reap what I've been sowing on my skin's not black. I've prayed and slaved and waited, and I've sung my song. You've bled me and you've starved me, but I've still grown strong. You've lashed me and you've treed me, and you've everything but freed me, but in time you'll know you need me, and it won't be long. I've seen the daylight breaking high above the bow. I've found my destination, and I've made my vow. So whether you abhor me, or deride me, or ignore me, mighty mountains loom before me, and I won't stop now. freedom and I won't turn back of climbing to the highway of my old track I'm coming and I'm going I'm stretching I grew up in New Jersey and uh, during the Depression, and uh, my father was working on his master's degree at the time, and he brought to East Orange a, ma a minister named Charles Albert Tindley uh, to speak at East Orange High School in the evening, but before that he brought him to our house. And he said, this is the man who wrote, stand by me, take your troubles to the Lord and lead them, 
leave them there. Uh, all these familiar hymns that we sang in church, and I was just flabbergasted to know that I was actually meeting the man that wrote the words and music to so many of those hymns. So uh, this is a takeoff on uh, the, the, uh, his song, Stand By Me, When the Storms of Life Are Raging, Stand By Me. Uh, it is partly based on, on uh, the song itself and the Bible and uh, my imagination. And uh, we're going to have the soloist to sing and play that for us. First? Huh? Are you doing the poem first or am I singing first? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll read it first. My Jesus was a standby friend. People in the Bible could always count on him being there whenever they was down on their luck. One time when he, when he was sailing with his buddies, a, su a sudden storm was fixing to turn their boat over and they all thought for sure they was gonna drown. But he stood up calm as you please and said, peace, be still. And then water settled down just like lambs and the storm stopped raging, and they was all able to make it back to shore in one piece. And when Mary, the bad one, was fixing to get stoned for, to death for being a hoe, he stepped up and said, hey guys, how come you so sure of what she's doing lest you've been doing it with her? If you don't want to deal with that, get lost. And they all took off running. Then he told her, go on now and don't do it no more. My Lord was something else all right, still is, and I can testify to that. He's carried me through all my trials and tribulations, and I've had more than my share of them. Seem like I get tossed around sometime, just like a boat in a storm, but I know I'm gonna make it through because I got my standby friend walking with me, holding my hand, taking up for me day after day after day. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the storms of life Raging, stand by me. When the world is tossing me like a ship upon the sea, thou who rulest wind and water, stand by me.
I have a very close friend who was a high school classmate of mine in St. Louis, class of 1941. And I, we're still in touch, but for a while, we hadn't seen each other for quite a number of years. And then we ran into each other again, and we're still in touch now. Uh, she invited me to come to their summer home in Florida. And uh, it was a wonderful trip. Uh, there was a beach nearby, and I knew that she had uh, given birth to five children and that her daughter had died. One daughter had died and had, was cremated, and the ashes were scattered over this beach. Uh, and while I was sitting there on the beach, uh, I had very strong emotional feelings about the years that had gone by and the years we had spent together. This is called Beach Scene. We wiggle our toes in the white sands of the beach at Passa Grill. Our lives open to each other as the translucent shells your grandchildren bring. How roughly the winds have blown us. How turbulently the waves of the Gulf surged to scatter us so far apart, yes, yet bring us back together here in this special place of pain and peace. Your daughter's spirit glides on the wings of seagulls, hovers on the rim of the earth as the red sun lowers, then slips beyond our view, leaving mauve streaks across the deepening shadows of the sky. I disappear for a while, but I will come again with the dawn. I will never leave you. We too rise in the daybreak of our renewal, the abyss of years bridged with our late night sharing. Our spirits draw closer, strengthened by new insights into who we were and who we have become. This poem is a rare stone I found hidden in the sand. Tuck it away in some secret place as a reminder that we can sometimes find again what we have lost, polished into new radiance, deeper splendor. My father was the uh, single most important influence on my life. I idolized him. Uh, he was a prominent Baptist minister, and uh, he got a lot of attention for his sermons. My mother was a stay-at-home mom. This was during the Depression. And we didn't have all of the modern conveniences that we have now. If it was wash day, it took you all day uh, to wash clothes and scrub them on the, on the washboard and hang them up to dry and then iron them when they got dry. It was an all-day affair, and she was always tired when uh, after dinner had been served. Well, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want that kind of life. I wanted to be like my father. And so he was the one that I really adored. It took me 70 years to write this poem about my mother. Uh, because I eventually realized just how much strength she had given me and uh, how much she had done for me and how she had helped me get over problems. It's called Reluctant Light. Mother, I didn't mean to slight you, but it wasn't you that I adored. You hid your energy in shadows, and I was dazzled by the sun. I idolized the one whose voice soared to prophetic heights, whose words rejuvenated epics of the ages. Some fine June Sundays, 
slender and magnificent in morning coat. He would electrify the pulpit with eloquent pronouncements of doom and glory so divine, the very gates of heaven seemed to part, bathing the atmosphere in crystal light. Seeking his favor, I rehearsed raising my hand like his in benediction, earning the childhood name of preacher, shortened in time to preach. You gave us daily sustenance, but there was never a choir's fanfare or the soul beat of the mighty to grant applause. You baked the bread for which we seldom thanked you, canned pears for winter, and mended depression-weary clothes, scrubbing sheets on a washboard, humming hymns to lift your sagging spirit, and cultivating beauty in endless flower pots. The summer when he toured the streets of ancient Palestine and Rome, you consoled yourself by painting pictures of the Appian Way using the kitchen table for an easel. You coached me with my homework, rejoiced in my small triumphs, and prepared me to confront the enemy, tapping your umbrella against my fifth grade teacher's desk to punctuate your demand for justice. I didn't recognize your subtle power that led me through blind, airless caves, your quiet elegance that taught me dignity, nor could I know the wind that bore him high into the sunlight emanated from your breath. I didn't want your journey, rebelled against your sober ways, but I have walked through my own shadows and, like you, transcended glitter. I have learned that I am source and substance of a different kind of light. Now when they say I look like you, and tell me that I have deepened to your wisdom, softened to your easy grace. I claim my place with honor in that court of dusky queens whose strength and beauty invented sons that others only borrow. And mother, I am glad to be your child. Uh, I, I mentioned that my father had been the greatest influence in my, in my life. Uh, I grew up during the Depression, and beggars would often come to the back door asking for food, and my mother would always accommodate them with a sandwich or some kind of food that they could take with them. But it was also during uh, Prohibition. Uh, alcoholic beverages could not legally be sold at the time. So some of the men weren't really hungry. They wanted money to buy bootleg booze. Uh, and one day, my mother went after feet, giving a man a sandwich. She went around the house and saw that he had thrown the sandwich into the bushes. And she said to my father, I'm going to stop the giving my good food to these men, and they don't want it. And his answer is in the poem. And you know how kids drop things on the floor and the parent may say, pick that up. I didn't drop it. Well, his answer to that is also in the poem. Uh, it seems to be uh, a contradiction. He was, he was very slim, but in the poem I say, say he towered over uh, cities because he had so much good influence on so many people. And he was also light-skinned, but I say he was the blackest man I knew because he taught me the things the textbooks didn't, te didn't teach about uh, African-American history and literature. He lives in me. My father was a strong and stalwart man. Slight of build, he towered over cities and had the might of armies. Light of skin, 
He was the blackest man I knew. In the unbeautiful years, he taught me pride. When despair was ready to engulf me, he rescued me with hope. By his hands, in his arms, I was immersed in waters of integrity and truth. I learned my lessons at his knee. The just shall live by faith. If a beggar asks for food but isn't hungry, that's his problem. If you turn him away and he really is, it's yours. And it isn't your responsibility to take the measure of his guile or honest need. If you see a toy with jagged edges, any obstruction, dropped on the floor or in the way, it doesn't matter if you put it there or not. You see it. You must remove it or you're just as guilty, maybe more so, as the one who left it there. I am my father's daughter. I make no apologies for being who, being who I am, for having learned integrity early in life. Make no excuses that my neighborhood was haven because my parents loved me and loved each other and made our home rock in a weary land. I go out of my way to kick banana peels or broken glass from sidewalks, try to remove obstacles no matter who put them there. I will not apologize. I cannot speak of him in metaphor or symbol. My father was upright, noble, and uncompromised, and he gave me all I needed to be proud, moral, and black and whole. I can only praise him now with hallelujahs, trumpets, cymbals, and drums. <laughs> this poem is called Pack Rat. My trouble is I always try to save everything. Old clocks and calendars, expired words buried in open graves. But hoarded grains of sand keep shifting as rivers redefine boundaries and seasons. Lengths of old string rolled into neat balls neither measure nor bind, nor do shelves laden with rancid sweets preserve what ants continually nibble away. Love should be eaten while it is ripe, and then the pits discarded. Lord, give me at last one cracked bowl holding absolutely nothing. My husband, uh, uh, sister and her husband uh, lived on uh, near a very busy street in Detroit, and we often went over to visit them on summer evenings and sat on the porch. And I had a very strange sense of peace and belonging there. And I knew I was going to write a poem about it, but I didn't know how it was going to come about. But on one occasion, my sister-in-law and my husband got into a disagreement about who a certain ancestor was. And uh, at the time, uh, their grandchildren were asleep upstairs, and I thought about the continuity of this old Detroit family that went back generations of Detroit living and the poems started coming together. Uh, we know that there are problems with cities, but there are also some very good things about neighbors who look after each other. City nights. My windows and doors are barred against the intrusion of thieves. 
The neighbor's dogs howl in pain at the screech of sirens. There is nothing you can tell me about the city I do not know. On the front porch, it is cool and quiet after the high-pitched panic passes. The windows across the street gleam in the dark. There is a faint suggestion of moon shadow above the golden street light. The grandchildren are asleep upstairs, and we are happy for their presence. The conversation comes around to Grandpa Henry, thrown into the Detroit River by an Indian woman seeking to save him from the sinking ship. Or was he the one who was the African prince employed to oversee the chained slave cargo, preventing their rebellion and for reward set free? The family will never settle it. Somebody lost the history they had so carefully preserved. Insurance rates are soaring. It is not safe to walk the streets at night. The news reports keep telling us the things they need to say. The case is hopeless, but the front porch is cool and quiet. The neighbors are dark and warm. The grandchildren are upstairs dreaming, and we are happy for their presence. I will read this if I can find it. Sonia wants me to read, uh, what's the name of it? Was it poem at 70? Attitude at 75? Yes. <laughs> I could also now call it attitude at 95 or 94. In this recurring dream, I am Tina Turner, flinging my wild wig at the world strut stomping across the stage on many skirted gams, ageless and untamed, completely in command and belting out my song, what's time got to do with it? <laughs> and I'm going to finish with uh, a poem called Renewal. These, these are such turbulent times that I hate to watch the news because it's all bad. But there is hope. It's called renewal. June is forever and forever returning. Howling headlines will not prevent it. Statistics cannot deny that which will be. In my springtime heart, I know that Earth will have its way. October, that old faker, coloring its leaves in deceptive gaiety, all the time meaning brittleness and brown death, doesn't fool me. December's snowflakes and gossamer enticements, hiding sludge and dirt under the wings of Christmas angels, can't forever deceive. I know what I know. There is something in the nature of things that is assuring, that tells me the people emerging from their dark lives to front porches and sunlight when the warm days come, know the secret the universe sometimes tries to conceal. Life forever rejuvenates itself. Whatever else happens, life lives. Everybody, one more time, one more time. Put your hands together for Dr. Magid, everybody. Put your hands together for Dr. Magid. Um, also, if I could have a secondary round of applause for 
West Michigan's Jazz Society's 2017 Musician of the Year, Robin Connell, everybody. And also, Sonia Ponce, everybody, Sonia Ponce. Um, it is a complete privilege that we get to listen to all these individuals, and whether you know it or not, uh, this is an incredibly historic event. Um, so like, be proud that you got to be here for a piece of history, that's incredible. Uh, many thanks to GRCC and the Grand Rapids Public Library for making this event possible. Without you guys, this event wouldn't have happened. Um, please, on your way out, check out these tables. Um, you can purchase this amazing human being's book, um, and you absolutely should purchase this book. And if you purchase this book, she will sign it for free. What? Free dollars? Sign it? That's crazy. Um, Please pick their brain. Do not be like the people uh, yesterday uh, who like made a comment about Flint water. Uh, that was like, a, we took that in stride. That was pretty smooth. Um, or as you heard, there is nothing about Detroit that you can tell her that she does not know. Do not come with a side comment of like, oh, I'm so happy Detroit is real popular now. Don't do that. Do not, do not make me upset with you. I, I don't want to hear it. Um, thank you guys very, very much. I appreciate you guys for coming out. You guys have an incredible day. Thank you guys so much. This is another. This is another Charles Albert Tindley uh, hymn called "We Are Often Tossed and Driven." We'll understand it better by and by. So, if you'd like to join in, you join in. <laughs> tempest off six seeds of bright sunshine in that land of perfect day when mists have rolled away we will understand it better by and by by and by when the morning comes all the saints of God again we'll tell the story Guides us with his eyes.